Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Okay, my name is Chen Hu. If I don't say Chen Hu, how many of you will pronounce my first name correct? Good. So it's Chen, Chen, Chen Hu. I work for Meta Corporation. I will invite my colleague and co-presenter. Uh, my name is Jim Lockett, and uh, I also work for the Meta Corporation. Okay. So we'll be talking about automatic core classification disambiguation and the routing using AI. You heard about the AI and machine learning for sp um, spoken language understanding. Let's see if I'm able to, great. So that's the outline. So we'll talk about the open-ended natural conversation. So during the lunch keynote speaker, I think they, he gave a very good introduction. You don't want to say press one, press two, then when it says five, you already forgot what are the options. So ours is going to be open-ended. We say, what can I help you? Then the user either give a command or they have a need. So it's all through natural language conversation. So, but we know language is rich. The same thing can be said in many different ways. So how can a machine understand the same thing by just like if one object can have multiple names depending who you are talking with. So language is rich, the variations. The second language is ambiguous. So we want to train a model that will be domain specific for the application so that you will understand what the user's input is and then do as what the user asks you to do. So if you use Amazon like Alexa or Google Assistant, you know it is wonderful, those uh, smart speakers, you can say set up time for five minutes, cancel my time, what's the weather? So those are general domain kind of things, it is doing really, really well. But then in our daily life, when people really need information, need to know what to do, when you ask a question, they will say, well, I'm still learning. So the system will say, I'm still learning. So what Jim and I are doing is going to train a system that are domain specific, <coughs> application specific, and provide interactive conversation to confirm the system identified execution action is indeed what the user want. So that whether that's the routing or provide more information will be completed by this water routing. So we'll um, introduce the approach and then give some examples. Okay. So this background, we know that speech recognition, automatic speech re recognition continue to mature. So now even it's a speaker independent, even you have accent, it does a really good job recognizing it. But even with 100% of speech recognition, the machine still doesn't really understand what you want to do. Because human language is not only redundant, ambiguous, sometimes people want to say less. Give me the time, what time? Another example is like I saw a demo, someone did a demo, they can ask their smart speaker to program to say, schedule my game and then they have all the numerical the numbers in <laughs> their built-in function, bless you. And then, so I said, well, I check that. So what about you say, okay, schedule my game time at nine o'clock. <coughs> because nine, we usually say nine, but nine in speech recognition sometimes is very easy to be captured. So in the air traffic controller, they don't say nine, they say nine. Just like a Zulu, you don't say zero, say so Zulu. So that kind of variation. So the system needs to be robust enough to understand variations of the same thing said by different words. So the focus of our talk, so at MITRE we do a lot of things. We work for the MITRE Corporation. This talk just describe our approach. How do we understand rich, ambiguous input from the user and understand what the user need and do accordingly by understanding what they do. 
So here we, are, we were going to play an audio, a, a video. It's just 90 seconds, just to give a, a picture of how this is doing. <coughs> So the sound is not working, Chen, so we'll, we'll just talk through it. Okay, the sound is not talking, so let's switch back to the slide. Okay. It's, um, it's bi-directional, it's conversational. So when the user say, is my child qualified for this program? So the system will say, how old is your child? Because for that application, we know there are some conditions that has to be met. In that case, it's the variables we need. So the user will provide my child is seven years old. Then we'll say, is your child a student? Then, well, if seven years old, then that already qualified for that program. But if they say the child is 21 years old, the program will ask, is your child a student? If it is a student, we'll still qualify for that program. But if it is over 30 years old by age, our system will say, is your child disabled? And then that will qualify for the program. So in a way, we'll get that variable from the user in order to know this user who called in is qualified for that program. So that will be the demo. So the goal of our system we call IVAS, which is Interactive Voice Agent and Service. So in fact, we are changing IVAS to Intelligent Virtual Agent and Services. Because when we worked on this project together in the first year, we only did voice. Now, with everything we do, <coughs> it can actually support the multiple channels, the chatbot, the phone instant um, message, all of them. And then the answer is individualized because we have all this information through conversation from the user. So the answer delivered to the user is individualized. And then the last point is a multimedia. The answer can be provided through voice or by text or can be an image. And later on, the interaction can be done through text, the chatbot. So this is a, a diagram of how that goes. I verbally described how that interaction goes about. It's interactive, individualized, and multimodal. So, um, yeah. So as Chen said, uh, I think the most critical aspect of our research is that we're trying to develop that ability for conversational dialogue <laughs> and uh, interpreting that business logic. And so uh, uh, using machine learning and uh, 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 natural language processing, we're parsing whatever kind of response we get and uh, uh, trying to interpret it. And so uh, in this particular uh, prototype that we've developed, um, we can interact with a caller or via chatbot or through an IVR so that uh, we can process that and continue an ongoing conversation. Um, so uh, one of the things that we did is that we've been able to uh, route calls instead of, you may have seen one of the presentations earlier today, obviously it's no longer the traditional IVR where you have a, a certain set of choices what you can do is go ahead and uh, uh, have a much more uh, uh, conversational experience with the, uh, uh, the IBIS, as we call it, the, in, uh, the interactive virtual agent. Um, so uh, we've been able, able to successfully be able to transfer calls to uh, and avoid the, uh, the experience of having to go through to a live operator. I'm going to turn it back to you, Chen. Okay, so um, one of the things, like um, the slide was like the, the requirement. When you want to do this, so after the correct understanding of the user's input, what does the system do? That's the routing part. Routing in this case is not simply connect to the live agent or transfer to another center. In fact, this routing based on this prototype have several requirements. If the user is asking for information, the system already have that information in the database, it's provided to the user. Or if that information is on the web portal, then we'll give the portal. 
And if the user is asking the nearest business center, then we'll ask, where's your location? They can provide e either the zip code or the city name. And in that case, if people say Windy City, you know Windy City is in Chicago, right? So in a way, our standing is so robust, not only the zip code and official names, but also the nicknames. Big Apple is New York. So we'll be able to understand all those variations that is really meaning that same thing. So this slide, so how do we do that? I mean, everything looks like it's magic. It's, it's not that easy. So in, in a way, in this talk, we want to talk about how do we accomplish to understand. Understanding natural language is hard, but there are a lot of tools. So the common usage is rule-based regular expression. You can anticipate when people want these things, how many ways they say this. So you can write a simple rules to anticipate. So we call that a rule-based expression approach. This approach is quick, but sometimes it fails really quickly because we cannot anticipate all possible ways people will use. We cannot anticipate the things they will add more or they will drop. So this is quickly turns um, not robust enough. So we turn into machine learning. So then we have data, domain-specific information. So the beauty of machine learning of AI is that there are a lot of resources that already have those information already embedded. So then, of course, when you do training, then you need the data. And the data need to annotate it. So you probably heard about annotated, meaning labeled. This core is about this purpose. So that's what we call as annotation. So we get some data from open resource, like uh, Yap and information.com, and a lot of government service website has those information. And then we annotated them and then trained them with some, with some already embedded, like word embedding, sentence embedding, and then with machine learning algorithms. So we tried logical repression, um, Repression classifier, and that with eight classes provide classification of 90, over 90% 90 of accuracy. Like if you have eight business services and people say anything about that service, then you can say this is this intent and can classify that correctly. So I just want to give a little bit of, so what's the magic behind it? Like every word, has so many dimensions or vectors. So when we talk about human beings, you can talk about the age, gender, or other things that's related, that's one dimension. And then when you talk about the verb, the verb have the aspect of tense, present, past, continuous, or daily. So that's another vector. And then when we talk about the country, country has a capital, has geology. So I'll just give another example. Why this vector, this machine learning, so many vectors is useful. So in this case, we have like um, 200 vectors in this word embedding. Like for example, from our face, if we talk about the dental, then jaw is not even related to the word dental, but semantically is related, is semantically related, so that when you are doing this prediction, is this person looking for dental office or for internal medicine? So all this word embedding is helping to make that disambiguation. But sometimes that may not be enough. So here is when we extended that eight classes problem into 10 class problem. Here's the performance. So we have the F measure in the, in the 90s. And then again, this is, we will say, is some data that we've done. And if this is for operational, real operational, we will need more data. So, but then this is a good approach to do. So domain specification and domain related data to train using the right model is the key. So it is achievable, but it is not like magic. You can do that really right away. Need the tools, methodology, and then need to track. So once you have that machine learning model, what do you do with it? For example, with that 10 class classification, 
when the user say, well, I would like to fill my prescription. And in this application is to connect the course to the right center. When we hear the prescription, we know that's a one very clear classification for pharmacy. But we want the system to be absolutely correct. Then we ask the user, can I connect you to the pharmacy? And the user say yes. If they say no, they will say, how can I help you? So this is like when the probability really indicate one winner is a pharmacy in this utterance. But sometimes you will have a tie. In this case, when the person say, there is blood coming out of my eye. Well, blood, sometimes blood test, is related to the lab. So you have two with very close probability. Then the system is smart to use <coughs> that system probability score to say, do you want the lab or the eye clinic? Then the user could say, I want A or B. So it's interactive and it's close in. But there's also the cases, the user say, neither. And the person would, would actually say, I need x-ray. Well, the user said they need an x-ray. Then we'll connect them to the radiology department. So in a way, it's interactive. It's a human machine partnered conversation. So that is quick, <coughs> accurate, and better user experience. So this, in a way, is describing that approach in a diagram. So this is the example that I already talked about, so I don't want to bore you. Um, implications? Yeah, so as Chen said, uh, we started out building this out uh, to work with smart speakers. So we had it working with Alexa and with Google Home. And then uh, we realized that uh, the focus should be on the natural language understanding. And so uh, we've shifted our research to focus on that and uh, made it so that it, it's multimodal, can be uh, used in chatbots, can be used for a text messaging service or integrated into an IVR. And so we've built out the platform so that it can integrate and uh, uh, could be used and uh, uh, integrated into any platform. Um, it, uh, it's an agnostic platform, so like I said, it can work with uh, um, uh, various uh, uh, vendors, the, the challenge is that sometimes we have difficulty actually getting the, the content. So one of the things that uh, we found is in, or, in order to further our research, uh, if we worked uh, on a chatbot, we could actually move more quickly. And so now we've built out the, uh, a chatbot where you can ask, answer questions. We don't have to focus on uh, the complexities of the speech recognition side of it, and we can actually just focus on the natural language processing. Uh, this way we can collect data and uh, refine our model uh, uh, more quickly. But what we have done is been able to add uh, the speech front end. So you, you can see down in the, where you enter text, you can actually speak the text or you can hear the, te uh, hear the text, uh, and, uh, and yet uh, uh, the user has the ability to be able to uh, manipulate their question. So uh, our, direct, our, our research going forward will be uh, uh, refining this so that we do it using a chatbot and then uh, continue to build our model so that we can still uh, enable it for multimodal purposes so that it can be used for uh, in an IVR or uh, uh, other various uh, um, uh, capabilities that would uh, be able to leverage the natural language processing. So. With that, we would like to uh, offer the opportunity yeah, to ask, thank you. for you to ask questions. Yeah, just want to summarize in a way, I'm saying three eyes. The three eyes means interactive, individualized, and the last is the intelligence. So using the intelligence, then the user will be able to interact with the system, and the answer is individualized, because we have a contextualized data application specific to train. So what we present here is really a system and a method that is extensible to other domains. So with that, any comments and questions? You are a terrific audience. Thank you. So no questions, huh? I saw one up there. You
How long does it take us to do what with the chatbot? Yeah, chatbot. How long does it take you to take you to do what? So I'm going to transition if I were to engage you. So uh, because we have a back-end architecture already in place, it took us a relatively uh, short period of time to actually build the chatbot. Uh, I've, a couple weeks. I mean, do, you we've got require, uh, do you require organizations to give you use cases, or you can, like you said, source it from open source in terms of the whole machine learning thing? Do I need to give you a use case of what I want? We, would, we normally start with a small data set, frequently asked questions, and build out on that. I mean, do you have anything you want to say there, Jen? Yeah, so the use case is really important. The use case, business, business logic, and also business language. Because we don't want to do anything that doesn't feel, look like the customer is already used to. So we stick with the same business logic and use the same vocabulary as if they were interacting when a live operator is in there but the machine is doing that. So in a way, it's not a machine totally replacing a human. We actually have to pick the brain of the human so that we, we train. There are some tough cases machine cannot deal with, so that using this approach, you can triage maybe 80 or 90% of the phone calls for automatic understanding and routing, but have that 10% complete cases for the live agent to do. And going back to your question about how long does it take, because the underlying technology of natural um, spoken language understanding, the model building is already done. So apply to the chatbot is relatively easier, but we do have to deal with the text-based uh, nature, because the spoken language is character, character, categorized by the spoken language, is fast, is natural, and it's more colloquial. But with the written language, sometimes people have mistyping. So you have a butter finger, you type. So if you have a word you really don't mean in there, you type it in there, what do you do? So we have to use more context to do the word correction and using context information to say what word the user may meant when they type it wrong. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's true. So that's, that is a problem the big speech recognition company are doing. So we are not building speech recognition company. There are so many big speech recognition companies, I think they are well represented in here. So there are ones that are specialized in like a particular dialect, like Southern English or the New Yorkers or the Bostonian, I park my car at the parking <laughs> yard, right? So if you really want the best experience feel really at home, you can use a specialized speech recognition for a particular region. But if you want your system to be general, then you can use a very well compensated, um, we, we don't use the standard because that's not <laughs> politically correct, or central. English that can compensate because the model is trained with so many varieties of dialect. Yes? Just a quick question. Did you say that once the model works with, uh, like, the, the bot is working and trying to answer the person, and then after when it's too complicated, we refer to a live agent? Mm -hmm. Once the conversation goes on with the live agent, does the uh, deep learning goes on, and we're trying to see how well we could improve next time to make that bot more intelligent through the conversation that was heard while speaking with the VA? Excellent question. So this is like learning on the job. So we are developing mechanisms to track. If this conversation several rounds and done, and we can ask the user to give feedback, give a rating, but we also track. Sometimes the conversation goes without transferring to a live agent, for common questions, then if that didn't go, then we'll say that's a failure. So we are tracking this uh, task completion accuracy and the time. And then also learning where it fell so that we can have this continued refining of our system. Yes, we're in the process of doing that. That's a great question. Yeah? Any other questions? And also, because we work for MITRE, we are unbiased. 
so we can use the best technology outside. And we produce recommendations for the government and also for the general public. So I'm sorry, your name is really long, <laughs> just like my name is really difficult. Yeah, we also have a research on mining audio cues for PTSD diagnosis. So that's why we really need to talk. I also want to call to your attention, there's a recent article that's published in Journal of Depression and Anxiety. They, the paper cited, they identified 18 features from the vocal, from the speech, from thousands of features to identify the person has the PTSD or not. Well, this study, because we are doing the same thing and I'm in collaboration with the VA and we have a large set of data. So that study, their, their first conference paper only have 59 subjects and about 19 have PTSD. And this latest article have 129 subjects and 50 have PTSD. So in a way, the study I think is important. Uh, but I think there's still like what you are doing and other people are doing. The problem is very complicated because PTSD is a condition which is not always at the same state. Because sometimes when people are acute at PTSD, their speech will reveal, will reveal all these physical characteristics, the tenseness of their vocal cord, the closeness of their they don't want to open their mouth wide, like these phones, like A will be shortened. So all those kind of things, like short utterances, will be very prominent. prominent. But at the times, if their condition is not at acute state, you don't capture that. So MITRE's approach is a multi-model. We use a lot of information, including speech emotion detection. And the transition from one emotion to another emotion because we are human. We, people do not have the condition, also have the emotions. But it's the change, that the temporal change of the emotion that may be turning apart the medical condition or not. So in a way, there's a lot of research that's going on. So it's a fascinating technology. <laughs> so, well, enjoy talking with you.